When asked on who I should do my National History Day project on, I had to think a little bit. I did not want to choose someone who everyone else would be doing, but also did not want to choose someone who no one has ever heard of before. I also wanted to choose someone who left their legacy right here in Wisconsin. After thinking about it, Frank Lloyd Wright was the perfect choice. His leadership in creating a new way to think in architecture, along with his legacy of homes in Wisconsin, has made Frank Lloyd Wright a great example of what all leaders must look like. In this documentary, you'll learn how Frank Lloyd Wright rose to stardom in architecture, personal troubles that he had to overcome, and finally, the specific works he left here on Earth. Please enjoy this Wisconsin original, Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright was born in Richland Center, Wisconsin on June 8, 1867. When he was 12 years old, Wright's family moved to Madison, where he attended Madison High School. During the summertime, Wright would go to his uncle's farm, where he began to realize his dream of becoming an architect. Wright never finished high school because he went to work for Alan Conover, ironically, the dean of the University of Wisconsin's engineering department. He let Wright attend two semesters studying civil engineering. After this, Wright moved to Chicago to work for an architect by the name of Joseph Slisby. Wright's first draft was of the Lloyd Jones Family Chapel, better known as Unity Chapel. Wright's early houses revealed a unique talent in the young architect. His houses, including no basements or attics, built with natural materials and never painted. His simplistic houses served as an inspiration for others. Over the next 20 years, Wright's influence continued to grow popularity in the United States and Europe. As I looked further into learning about Frank Lloyd Wright, I wanted to really know how it was to work with him. So I dug deep and found a Frank Lloyd Wright enthusiast who actually worked with Frank Lloyd Wright. Her name, Becky Burns. Well, uh, I actually have bumped into him or nearly bumped into him once or twice because he was a great uh, customer of the um, Manchester store in Madison and he was there frequently and as it happens that summer I was working there. And so I asked her, how was it working with Frank Lloyd Wright? Well, it depended. Now, if you were a customer, he could tell you exactly what you needed and how soon they could make it for you. <laughs> but uh, you, had, you had to have his uh, style would take preference at all costs. Because Wright disliked the urban environment, his buildings also developed a style quite different. He used skylights and walls of windows to embrace nature. He built skyscrapers that mimicked trees. He believed that the houses shouldn't be in nature, it should be in tune with nature. One of the most famous houses sh showing this clearly is known as Falling Water. Built in 1935, the house is built partly over a waterfall. Time Magazine cited it as Wright's most beautiful job. It even made the Smithsonian's life list of 28 places you should visit before you die. As Wright's career progressed, so did technology of the glass industry. Wright believed glass allowed for interaction and viewing of the outdoors while still protecting from the elements. Wright often compared glass to nature's mirror, such as a lake or pond. By using a large amount of glass, Wright wanted to achieve a balance between the lightness of the glass to the solid of the walls. Wright fully embraced glass in his designs and found that it fit well into architecture that he created, called organic architecture. In an interview with Frank Lloyd Wright, he describes his architecture as where the whole is the part, as the part is to the whole, and where the nature of the materials, the nature of the purpose, the nature of the entire performance becomes a necessity. Out of that comes what significance you can give the building as a creative artist. Wright's life wasn't all about architecture though. Going back in time, on August 15, 1914, a male servant who had been hired several months earlier set fire to the living quarters of another famously built building of Wright, the Taliesin. The servant proceeded to murder seven people with an axe as the fire burned. The murder victims included Wright's wife and his two children. Wright was devastated. After all, he was only 47 years old. Following the tragedy of Taliesin, 
Wright received a letter of condolence from the sculptress named Miriam Noel. A romance soon bloomed, and Wright asked her to move in with him at Taliesin, even though his first wife refused to give him a divorce. In 1916, Wright took Noel to Tokyo, Japan so that they could oversee the construction of the Imperial Hotel. Upon their return in 1922, he learned that his wife agreed to a divorce. Free at last, after more than a decade of separation, he married mentally disturbed Noel in 1923, but they separated in 1924 and divorced in 1928. While still married to Noel, Wright encountered another woman by the name of Olga Milanoff. In February 1925, Wright invited her to live with him at Taliesin. Two months later, she was divorced, and by the end of the year, she bore him a daughter, Ivana. So after learning about Frank Lloyd Wright's marriages, I had to ask Becky, what his critics thought about him? Well, people that have worked with him knew that he was difficult, knew that he wasn't quick on paying bills, for one thing, <laughs> and uh, that he, was, he had his methods and his design and everything all up there in his head and that's the way it was going to be and he was going to tell you that's how you should think it should be as well. With the coming of the Great Depression, architectural commissions became scarce. Wright turned first to writing and lecturing. After this wasn't profitable, Wright responds with an altered architectural style he calls Usonian with the goal to design affordable housing. With this, Wright effectively pioneered the concept of the ranch-style home. After the Great Depression and pre-World War II, Wright generates his first proposal for the Monona Terrace, to be built on the site of the current Monona Terrace. The plan included an auditorium, a rail depot, a courthouse, and a city hall. Local newspapers referred to the project as the Dream Civic Center, linking Wisconsin's state capital with Lake Monona. Wright presents his plan to the county board who defeat it by a single vote. Wright considers maybe it's not the right time and decides to keep the plan for a later date. In 1941, Madison voters approve funding for a municipal auditorium and Wright introduces his Monona Terrace plan with some modifications. Wright was about to begin the process when World War II intervened and shut the project down. Again, Wright would have to wait for another date to begin this massive project. Finally, the post-war economic boom helped Madison voters approve a $4 million bond referendum for an auditorium and a civic center. Wright is narrowly approved as the architect, and the current site of Monona Terrace is selected. Wright said that being elected project architect for the Monona Terrace by the people of Madison meant more to him than any other reward. Wright worked on the project from 1957 to 1959. On August 9, 1959, in Phoenix, Arizona, Frank Lloyd Wright dies five days after having an intestinal surgery. Frank Lloyd Wright never retired from his profession. At the age of 92, he had designed more than 1,100 projects, nearly half of which were built. Wright believed that a true American style of architecture can come from the landscape of America, Rather than styles imported from overseas, he believed people should be able to afford beautiful places to live rather than settling for the same old styles from hundreds of years ago. His buildings changed how people lived and worked. Wright's belief in incorporating architecture with nature and art helped realize a dream for many of his clients. He left so many beautiful buildings here on earth, and I contend he is the most influential American architect who has ever lived and his legacy survives through his ideas, and most of all, the buildings themselves.